Exercise 14 deals with the gross anatomy of the brain and the cranial nerves. The brain is divided into different regions. If you look at the adult brain, you've got four main regions. You have the cerebrum, the diencephalon, which is composed of the thalamus, hypothalamus, pineal gland. You have the cerebellum, and then you have the brain stem, which is comprised of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. Got it. If we start with the cerebrum, this is the largest of the components or structures within the human brain. It's responsible for the ability to receive and interpret sensations, to understand and form intellectual thoughts, to store the memories, develop emotions, personality, initiate some of the, the voluntary motor activities. So what you typically think of the more higher brain level functioning occurs in the cerebrum. The cerebrum is divided into two hemispheres. There's a right and a left. With the brain, when we look at it, <clears throat> see the ridges that are present are known as the gyri, so all these ridges here. The shallow grooves are the salsas, and the deeper grooves, like right along here, are known as the fissures. The lateral salsa is shown here. It will go through different components, and you see they are highlighted. The central salsa is from the lateral and it's a uh, superior view. The longitudinal fissure is the deepest one that separates into the two different hemispheres. The corpus callosum is this bridge of nerves that virus that are going to connect the left and right hemispheres together. Once again, this is showing the corpus callosum with, from different viewpoints. Now each hemisphere is then subdivided into lobes. There's five different lobes. You have the frontal lobe, and this is, um, once again, we're going back to that regional uh, anatomical terminology list that you learned in the very beginning becomes helpful. So you have the frontal lobe, you have the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, the temporal lobe, and then beneath that it's going to be uh, the insula that is deeper to the others. With the cerebrum, one thing that's interesting is that the gray matter is found in the cerebral cortex area. The white matter is going to be deeper to that. Remember, cortex tends to be on the outside of things. Basal nuclei are regions of gray matter that are deep within the white matter. So <coughs> just the reason I'm mentioning this is that you will see the reverse with the spinal cord. So from once again from different viewpoints on here, you can see that the this would be the white matter here, the orange is showing the the gray matter, and then the deep gray matter here. Once again, the white matter is deeper to the gray matter when we were talking about uh, the brain. The fornix links, links different regions of the limbic system together. As you can see, this highlighted in orange here. The limbic system um, controls a lot of our emotions. And you'll notice, as we certainly in your lecture, we'll talk about how different nerves pass through the limbic system, and then we'll give emotional connotations to things. The diencephalon has several different components or subgroups, if you will, within it. The first, the thalamus. The thalamus, as is highlighted here, serves as a basically a relay station. A lot of nerves will pass through here. Sensory uh, nerves will pass through. It's going to help regulate a lot of various motor activities, emotions once again, uh, memory, learning. Things like the pineal gland is located posterior to the thalamus. It is an endocrine gland. It does secrete melatonin. Uh, when we study the endocrine system, you'll find that melatonin is a hormone that helps to regulate our day-night cycles and our sleep patterns. So it is very small, but it's it's posterior to the thalamus.
the hypothalamus, and once again, this is all part of the diet supplement, the hypothalamus is also uh, involved not only with the brain but with the endocrine system as well. It produces hormones that uh, will then be stored in the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus is very important with helping to maintain homeostasis. That is keeping that internal balance that is necessary for survival. So it helps to regulate things such as heart rate and blood pressure and body temperature and water balance, um, a lot of these very vital functions. So in some ways, it's, it's kind of like control center for the brain. Also within the diencephalon, you do have that pituitary gland that the hypothalamus is coordinating with. It's connected to the hypothalamus by um, a stalk, basically. It's called the infibidulum. The pituitary gland is divided into two parts. There's the anterior pituitary and the posterior. So the hormones from the hypothalamus will be stored in the posterior pituitary, and then the anterior one produces its own hormones. And once again, we'll study this in detail with the endocrine system. But with the pituitary gland in general, it helps to regulate uh, some of the other hormones, uh, some of the other endocrine glands and the hormones secreted by there, such as the thyroid, the gonads, which are the ovaries and testes, the adrenal cortex helps all the things like water balance so you don't get dehydrated. No. The mammary bodies, these are relay stations for the olfactory pathway. They're, they are paired. So there's two of them there, as you can see, highlighted and enlarged. The olfactory bulbs, they receive um, sensory information from the nasal cavity. Olfactory is sense of smell. And then the tracts will contain, take those impulses received from the olfactory bulb and sends it to the other sections of the brain to interpret that incoming information. The optic nerves, they receive visual impulses from the eyes. Those optic nerves are going to cross at an area known as the optic uh, chasm in this area. And will also deliver that impulse, similar to olfactory, to an area of the brain where the interpretation takes place of what you are visually seeing. So here's the optic chasm, and then it's going to go down to the appropriate visual region for interpretation. The brain stem, once again, divided into different components. First, the midbrain. This, <coughs> excuse me, has four mounds of tissue. It's called the corporate quadrangle. It's located at the, the posterior base of the cerebrum. It's divided into a superior and inferior colloquy. And this is where you're going to find some of your auditory reflex centers and visual reflex centers. So as you can see here. The pons, this is looks like a mound of tissue. It's on the anterior surface, and it's a relay station sending information from the spinal cord to the brain and back. So it has to, information coming from the spinal cord has to pass through the pond on its way towards the brain. And then the medulla oblongata, this once again is part of the brain stem. If you look, this, this is the uh, spinal cord right here. So information is going to be coming up through the medulla to the pons and on further up into the brain. It also, the medulla, contains control centers for things like respiration, controlling the heart rate, controlling uh, blood pressure. Damage to the medulla, damage to any area of the brain stem, is very, very critical because of these control centers that are here that basically are controlling functions that are keeping you alive. The cerebellum. It is receiving sensory information from various receptors, such as from your skeletal muscles, your joints, helping you to be aware of your body position. And it helps to initiate some of these voluntary movements, makes adjustments. So you have, hopefully, some of us you may question, but hopefully nice, smooth, well-coordinated muscle contractions and not real jerky. The cerebellum, 
the interesting thing here, yes, that the cortex area, the outermost area, has the gray matter, just like you see with the uh, cerebrum. And very interior to that or deep to that is the white matter. And the way it looks, it's almost like a tree with the little branches from it. And so it's referred to as the Arbor VD. It's just a very classic, unique thing that you see when you do a dissection of the, the cerebellum. The cranial meninges, this is a multi-layer connective tissue that covers the brain and the spinal cord. There are three main layers of this. If you're starting superficial and working deep, the three layers are the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. What happens is the meninges are helping to uh, surround and protect the brain and the spinal cord from trauma from injury and <coughs> along with the meninges you're going to have what we call the superior sagittal sinus this is going to drain venous blood from the brain you do have fluid that does go between some of the layers of the meninges so in this cross section obviously here is your skin the bone is right here of the skull the periosteum is that outer connective layer. You have the dura mater. Now in the brain, the dura mater can be subdivided into two sub layers. In the spinal cord, it's only one. So you have your dura mater. <coughs> Excuse me. You have your arachnoid model, and then you have your pia model, which is directly right attached to, in this case, we're looking at the brain. Your sub arachnoid space would be the space between the pia model and the arachnoid model. The subdural space is between the dura model and the arachnoid model. And so this is showing um, on a cadaver where you have, you can see the occipital lobe, this whitish covering here. This is the dura mater that has not been removed yet. Over on this side, the meningulator has been removed. So here's the occipital lobe of the cerebrum, and down here is the cerebellum. And then down here, you can still see the arachnoid model that's over the medulla oblongata and the spinal cord being connected down here. The cranial nerves, there are 12 pairs of these nerves. They are connected to the brain. They are considered part of the peripheral nervous system because they are not the brain itself, but they do connect to the brain. Some of these will be mixed nerves, meaning they contain both sensory and motor neurons in there. Others of them are complete sensory ones. Uh, they supply different or innervate different structures of the head and neck, except for one, which is the vagus nerve. This will also supply organs of the thorax and the abdominal region. Um, they are numbered using Roman numerals 1 through uh, 12, and so you must be familiar with them. As with anything, I always say start at one area and learn in order from the location of them. So if you start up here, the, you've got the olfactory nerve, and like I said, they are numbered by Roman numerals. Moving down from that, you have then the optic nerve, the ocular motor nerve is number three. Number four, so this was the ocular nerve. Number four is the trochlear. The trigeminal nerve is number five. And number six is the abducens. How are you supposed to remember these? There's all different ways. Some people just memorize them. Find what works for you. You can use any one of these various phrases. If it helps you, that's great. Um, or make up your own little mnemonic phrase that will help you to remember them. So once again, 
this is showing the first six. And then over here we do have 7 through 12. The cerebral spinal fluid is produced um, in an area of the brain called the choroid plexus and then it's going to circulate through cavities that are deep in the brain and then eventually circulate down through the spinal cord. It helps this uh, fluid helps to act as a shock absorber and protect the brain. So the ventricles are these cavities deep in the brain that the cerebral spinal fluid is going to be flowing through. They are interconnected so the fluid can easily flow from one of the ventricles to another. Uh, once again, like I say, the purpose of the cerebral spinal fluid or CSF is to protect, act as that shock absorber. Um, it does also help to protect against infection. It should not have any um, certainly microorganisms in it. When they do a spinal tap, that is what they are doing. Is they are removing some of the CSF and they can analyze to see if there is microbial infection in there. So from uh, different perspectives here, it is showing the different uh, ventricles or these different chambers. You have the two lateral ones, one in each of the cerebral hemispheres. And then you have the foreman right here, the interventricular foreman, to connect to the third ventricle. So these, if you're wondering what happened to one and two, that's those are the lateral ones. The third ventricle. Then you have <coughs> excuse me, the mesencephalic aqueduct, which connects to the fourth ventricle, which is then going to go down the central canal of the spinal cord. The septum pollicium is a thin membrane that does divide the lateral ventricles there. You see? <coughs> what are some clinical correlations or uh, applications of this? Parkinson's disease. Someone who is suffering from Parkinson's, as it progresses, the muscle tremors get more and more obvious that when you're at rest, um, you see this shaking. It is due to the muscle tremors. You have, the individual has difficulty controlling voluntary movements. Um, there are different I, suggestions as to what may cause it. We don't know exactly what the cause is. There have been some correlations made to exposure to pesticides may increase the risk. Um, one thing we do find, dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter, those productions tend to decline in individuals who suffer from Parkinson's disease. And so part of the treatment is to try to administer uh, a precursor to dopamine to try to make up for that. Another clinical uh, correlation is what is known as SAD or seasonal affective disorder. The pineal gland responds to your day light cycles by producing melatonin. In some areas of the world where, especially as you get closer to the poles, and so in winter when there's less daylight, there tends to be um, more melatonin production tends to increase. What happens with increased melatonin production then is you have a disruption of the sleeping pattern, which you tend to have a disruption of the eating patterns, and sometimes mood changes. And so for a long time, this was not really thought of as a disorder, but it, it now is, is certainly recognized as an actual disorder. Um, People tend to have these mood swings. They tend oftentimes to be, get very depressed then in the winter time. Um, one way of combating it they have found is if you can have artificial lighting, that that tends to help. Um, I'm familiar then in some areas of like in Alaska and Anchorage because in the winter time they have such a long periods of darkness. Um, that one thing that they have done to try to combat this is their parks and throughout town have extensive amounts of street lighting to try to simulate daylight hours. 
Um, I actually had a roommate who suffered from this. And when we were both in graduate school in northern Idaho, I could see a definite change in her. If we had, say, three days in a row of cloudy weather, she just started getting very depressed, very down. Um, and it, it got to be very noticeable. And she finally recognized it and realized that once she graduated and had a job, she could not live in an area. She tried living in Seattle for a while, and she could not live there because they have so many cloudy days. She became very, very depressed, actually became very, for a short time, was suicidal until she got out of that area and learned that um, she ended up moving to Phoenix, which is probably the best place for her. Um, some people, I say, there's different ranges of it. Some people are able to combat it simply by having lots of lights on to simulate the daylight hours, that that can be enough to, just to help. Other people, they may have to start medication, but it is now recognized as an actual disorder. The epidural space is that space that's located between the dura mater and the cranial bones. So when you receive an epidural, that's where they're going to be injecting the medicine. Subdural space, as I said earlier, is between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater. Um, if you have a subdural hematoma or epidural hematoma, this is where some of the blood vessels are torn in the meninges. Um, what happens is if the blood vessels are torn, you've got that blood leaking into that area, and that will exert pressure on the brain. Because of the skull, there's no place to relieve that pressure, so you're going to have to surgically go in and relieve that pressure um, as soon as possible. Relieve the pressure so that it does not put extra pressure on the brain and then cause brain damage. Hydroencephalus is where you have an overaccumulation of your cerebral spinal fluid in the brain. Um, there's been a blockage, somehow it's not draining properly from the ventricles. This could be due to a tumor, it could be due to an infection, meningitis, which is an inflammation of the meninges, can often then interfere with the flow of the CSF. And so, number one, you have to figure out what is the cause of the lack of drainage. If it's an infection, start antibiotics. If it's a tumor, you're going to have to deal with that, see if you can remove the tumor. You do need to relieve that pressure because, once again, the increased fluid, because it's not draining properly, increases pressure on the brain and can cause damage to the brain. So you need to, to relieve that pressure, number one, and then number two, look at why is it not draining? What's the, the cause of it? If it occurs in newborns and infants, um, the cranial bones, because they're still growing and developing, they may end up um, expanding, becoming larger than normal. What is the treatment? Is that you can put a shunt that can divert that extra fluid from the ventricles. Uh, oftentimes what it'll do is drain it into one of your superficial veins in the neck. But you must be able to relieve that pressure. 